In the Bible, the total helplessness of God's people proves so often to be the backdrop for God's deliverance. God is in control. As we stand, let's pray. Lord, give us ears to hear your word and hearts to obey. For your name's sake. Amen. Please take a seat and turn to 1 Samuel 13 on page 282 of the Bibles. And the question, what have you done from verse 11, is our title. And there's an outline of the sermon on the back of your service sheet. What have you done? Apparently that was the question my wife was asking herself shortly after marrying me. <laughs> but of course that's not what we're thinking about here. Rather the sort of what have you done that parents ask a naughty child. Jonathan, what have you done? I can hear my parents cry ringing out even now as they saw all the bees escaping from my dad's beehive, which I've been told never to touch. A thick, black, buzzing cloud then formed into a major swarm in the garden, hungry, it seemed, for someone to envelop and sting, as I stood there holding the white piece of wood that had, until I removed it, kept the bees happily inside the hive, creating honey. I was deservedly punished, and no longer will bees be kept by the Redfern family. You may well remember a similar cry. What have you done? Or perhaps sometimes you say to yourself, What have you done? For we're all sinners. Ruin can come so suddenly. Just as we see here, in 1 Samuel 13, a chapter marked by serious role failure and Israelite helplessness. Why? Well, first, a lack of leadership. Verses 3 to 4, Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, Let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost. And now Israel has become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. Now did you notice that it's Jonathan, not Saul, who takes the initiative against the Philistines? Now three cheers for Jonathan. But rather worryingly, he's the, son, the king's son, not the king. Why didn't Saul take the initiative? Why didn't Saul go out before Israel as he was supposed to do according to chapter 8 and verse 20? Well, of course, in the Gilgal son, it's Saul who gets the credit. But does Jonathan's success mean his father is lacking? Is this further evidence that Saul fears men rather than God, as we saw back in chapter 10? And what about us? How do we cope in the face of what appears to be a powerful enemy? Do we stand firm in Christ or do we freeze? Do we keep our heads or do we keep them only because we're, we're never willing to put them above the parapet? Or are we happy just to leave it for the younger ones, the next generation, to fight the battles? Now, of course, we're to train up the younger generation to be the church leaders of today and tomorrow. And at JPC, we probably need to be more strategic about that. Let's face it, I and the others are not getting any younger. But what about those of us already in leadership? Those called to lead humbly now. Are we, in the words of Paul to Timothy, too timid? As I reflect on approaching a significant birthday... 21 again, of course. It's sobering to think that much of the recent spiritual and moral drift of this nation has happened in my lifetime. On our watch, so to speak. What have we done? As Christina Adoni, writing in one newspaper this week, put it, 
Christians must fight back. Not with the weapons and ways of the world, but with the spiritual weapons we have through faith in Christ. The helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness. Prayer and God's word, which Ephesians 6 teaches, is the sword of the Spirit. Will we? As David said a little while ago, there needs to be a non-violent Christian uprising in this nation. For as Paul also says to Timothy, God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. The lack of godly leadership in much of the church hierarchy and nation in the UK has been evident for years. So if the Sauls won't, the Jonathans need to take a lead. Now that doesn't mean there should be a coup here at JPC. No, David has been one of the exceptions by God's grace over the last 40 years. But we need to pray for God to raise up more leaders. Men after God's own heart. Who are committed to King Jesus and to his work. You see, we must remember that we also learn here that God's purposes aren't thwarted when his more so-called authorized servants prove reluctant. God has others who prove willing in the day of his power. For example, perhaps there would have been no need for George Whitfield's practice of preaching in the fields in the 18th century had more Anglicans been preaching the same gospel in their buildings. Secondly, a lack of obedience, verses 5 to 15. But what's really central to this chapter is what happens in verses 7 to 14. Have a look at those verses where Saul disobeys God. A lack of obedience which has serious and major consequences. Saul's kingdom would not endure. A new line of kings would be established. The line of David. A man after God's own heart. And a line which would culminate in the one true king. The savior of the world. Now some of you might be thinking, can we really blame Saul for his disobedience? Considering the might of the Philistines. And the quaking fear of his army. And doesn't the punishment seem rather harsh for not waiting for Samuel for seven days, as he'd been told to do back in chapter 10 and verse 8? When he'd waited into the seventh day, and when his army was deserting all around him? Should we not sympathize a little with Saul here? Would we not have been tempted to do the same? Are we not tempted to do the same? To fall into disobedience when outnumbered in the workplace, or wherever we might be. To go our own way rather than trusting God. Believing and obeying his word to the end. Look first at the seemingly overwhelming opposition in verses 5 to 7. Just picture the scene as you look at these verses. The Philistines assemble to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots. 6,000 charioteers. And soldiers as numbers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth-Avon. When the men of Israel saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets, among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. No doubt Saul felt under pressure. But did he really need to panic? It's unlikely that the Philistines would have attacked him there in such an isolated place near the River Jordan. Indeed, Gilgal was where Samuel had instructed Saul to assemble back in chapter 10 and where he was explicitly told to wait until Samuel arrived to tell him what to do regarding the battle. God's prophet would give him God's guidance for the war. That was the order. That was the promise. So what exactly did Saul do? Look at verses 8 through to 14. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offerings. 
Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You acted foolishly, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not end you. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. You see, Samuel was the bearer of God's word and Saul was to wait for it. But Saul panicked and didn't wait the full seven days or for Samuel to arrive as he'd been instructed. He feared man rather than God. He lost faith that Samuel would arrive and decide to proceed without God's word. And even blamed Samuel for doing so. Do we identify with that? Not trusting God to the end? Becoming impatient with God rather than being willing to wait obediently and then blame God when it all goes wrong? For Saul's sacrificial ritual was essential. But prophetic directive dispensable. He failed to submit to God's word. When faced with great difficulty, he decided to go it alone and do it his way. Kingship and leadership is prone to such pride. Dale Ralph Davis in his brilliant commentary on 1 Samuel illustrates this point with reference to, to James VI of Scotland who of course became James I of England and the sponsor of the King James Bible. Apparently he was notoriously rude when attending worship services. On one occasion he was seated in his gallery with a number of courtiers while a man called Bruce preached. As usual, James started talking to those around him during the sermon. The preacher paused and the king fell silent. Bruce started again, and so did James. Bruce stopped again. Same thing happened. So when the king committed the same offense for the third time, the preacher turned and began to address the king directly with these words. Of course, in a bit of a different accent. It is said to have been an expression of the wisest of kings. When the lion roars, all the beasts of the field are quiet. The lion of the tribe of Judah is now roaring in the voice of his gospel. And it becomes all the petty kings of the earth to be silent. Kings and leaders can so easily forget they are subjects. Like James, they and even we can ignore God's word quite blatantly or more subtly like Saul. Now we thank God that our queen hasn't forgotten that she is subject, subject to the true king. But what of her eldest son and potential successor? Has he not disobeyed God blatantly and distanced himself from God's word and the uniqueness of the Christian faith? How will that impact on whether he will rule and on his dynasty? Which brings us to verse 15. Then Samuel left Gilgal and went up to Gibeah in Benjamin. And Saul counted the men who were with him. They numbered about 600. Samuel leaving Gilgal meant that Saul was now without the guidance and direction of God's word. Saul had isolated himself from what he needed most. Now today we have constant access to God's word on our various media devices. But do we do the same? Do we sometimes go it alone and isolate ourselves from God's word, from reading the Bible and prayer? What a privilege to have such access to it in so many formats. 
and yet how easily we disregard it, even when we need it most. Are we reading and applying God's word each day? Do we really believe what it says? Or do we lose faith in it when it comes to the crunch? So Saul was essentially on his own at a time of great difficulty. Which brings us to my third and final heading. A seeming lack of hope and help. Verses 16 to 23. Some of you know that my football team is Leeds United and that a certain person by the name of Redfern was in temporary charge until a new manager was appointed yesterday. The reputation of my family name was suffering as they kept losing under that caretaker manager. And until yesterday, there was an atmosphere of hopelessness and helplessness at Leeds with a lack of someone with wisdom at the helm as just as there was in Israel after Samuel left Saul on his own. So when Samuel leaves Saul to go to Gibeah, the future looks very bleak for Israel. Fundamentally, there's now no guidance from God's word. Saul has no resources, verse 20. And Saul himself contributes to, to Israel's helplessness. He is part of Israel's hopeless case. And this lack of leadership and obedience and direction from God's word has led to a despair seen throughout this chapter. Where there is no vision, the people perish. There was little support from many Israelites. As we've already seen, verses 5 to 7 tell us that most either hid or fled. Even Jonathan's early victory was not seen as an encouraging sign of God's help. And now as we see in verses 16 to 18, there was no defense against Philistine raiders who were coming from all sides, north, west, and southeast. The Philistines could dominate at will. There were no weapons for Israel to use, and the Philistines kept them disarmed. The Israelites even had to go to the Philistines to get their farm implements serviced, for a fee, of course. Look at verses 19 to 22. Not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel because the Philistines had said, otherwise the Hebrews will make swords and or spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plowshares, mattocks, axes, and sickles sharpened. The price was two-thirds of a shekel for sharpening plowshares and mattocks, and a third of a shekel for sharpening forks and axes, and for repointing goads. So on the day of the battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan, had a sword or spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. It all highlights Israel's helplessness. And in some ways it's similar to the state of the church and nation in the Western world today. Perhaps you'd be especially aware of the despair of it if you lived in Greece at the moment. But not just Greece. What have they and we done? A lack of leadership? Disobedience to and an isolation from God's word in the form of an immoral capitalism? Disarmed Christians who ignore God's word? And attacks from secularists who don't want prayers in the public square, but who, along with some in the church, do want gay marriage? We are suffering from a turning away from God's word and from a famine of God's word. So are we to feel hopeless as God's people today? Is this the end of Western Christianity? Well, for more on that from 1 Samuel, they have to come back next Sunday night as 1 Samuel 14 is the second half of what's recorded here in 1 Samuel 13. But let me say this from 1 Samuel 13. Because this chapter highlights Israel's helplessness. We are not to be hopeless about Israel's hopelessness or about what is happening in the church and nation today. If we are to be biblical, we are to be realistic optimists, as David Holloway usually reminds us. For in the Bible, the total helplessness of God's people proves so often to be the backdrop for God's deliverance. God is in control. He is working his purposes out. 
just before the 18th century evangelical revival began, there were apparently only six people who attended the Easter Day service at St. Paul's Cathedral. Spiritually, the church and the nation were at a very low ebb. Hopelessness and helplessness would no doubt have been in the air. Yet God, in his mercy, brought change. His word got out to people through men such as George Whitfield, who feared God and not man. Saul did not repent, but rather blamed Samuel. We need in our helplessness to turn to the one true king in repentance and faith. To Jesus Christ who took the punishment we deserve on the cross for our rebellion against God. So that we can be forgiven for whatever we have done. And have the most amazing hope made known to man. To not panic or lose our heads, but keep our heads for God is in control, and prayerfully step out in faith, reading and obeying his word, getting his word out, whatever the cost, getting out of our comfort zone to be salt and light in the power of his spirit, to no longer conform to the pattern of this world, but to make a difference for him in this world, to build on the rock of Jesus Christ and his word, and to pray. And please be praying for our application to start Clayton Academy this week as that application goes in to the Department for Education. To all this, you have been called if you're trusting in Christ. And these are critical times. How do you want to be remembered? What will your epitaph be? That you were disobedient and fearful like Saul? Or like that of Saul's successor, David? That you served God's purpose in your generation and then you died? That's Acts chapter 13 and verse 36. Remember, we are on the victor's side. Christ is before all things and in him, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who 1 Samuel 13 points to. All things hold together and he will come again. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. The future is not hopeless for those who belong to Christ. Indeed, as Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against Christ's true church. It will be the only institution on earth that will last. Let's pray together. Let's be quiet for a moment. Perhaps we need to repent for what we have done and turn to Christ. And commit ourselves afresh to him tonight. To be salt and light.